Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Zilberman. I'm a professor of agricultural and resource economics at the uh, University of California, Berkeley. And I have the pleasure to have a conversation with one of the people that I most adv admire and love, Gordon uh, Rauser. He is a scholar, entrepreneur and leader, and uh, I would like to ask him several questions about uh, his career and his life. Thank you much, very much, David. I'm looking forward to this interview. Uh, you, and I've, you and I have had many interviews of each other over the years, uh, and this may be the most meaningful of all. Let's see if we can make it work. Gordon, uh, the first thing that uh, I think everyone would like to know is how it all started. Tell us about your childhood and uh, how you became a uh, a scholar or a professor? Well, I was raised on a small family farm in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, my father had a dairy farm. Um, it never grew very much. Um, he initially worked for the county leveling land and then ultimately started a small herd of dairy cattle. And it was a cl classical family farm. There was only one outside employee who did the milking of a herd size that ultimately grew to 130 cows when I was probably about eight years old. But up to that point in time, my father and I are the only ones that worked outside. My mother and older sister had all the responsibilities of uh, cooking and preparing meals and taking care of the house itself. So it was a traditional fam family farm. Mm -hmm. So when did the what made you go to college, and why did you make the selection that you made? Uh, well, ultimately, throughout grammar school and high school, uh, I was not the best of student, uh, to say the least. I spent most of my time um, in sports activities and working on the farm. Uh, I would have to come home early to do chores. I got up at 5 o'clock every morning and had to do chores. At nine years old, I was the relief milker of 130 cows, getting up at two o'clock in the morning and doing two o'clock in the afternoon, which limited my extracurricular leisure time activities uh, when I got to be 16 and older. But at that point in time, I knew, even though none of my cousins or none of my uncles or aunts, with one exception, actually went to college, but I knew all along that I wanted to go to college, and initially, uh, I wanted to go to college in large part to learn the basics of dairy science, and I was going to come back to the farm and try to grow it to compete effectively with all the other large operators, most, most of which were immigrants from Holland or Portugal. And I always thought that my father was far too risk averse. And I was going to change that, but I was going to get some scientific foundation for doing so. So I went um, to college for a actual um, term degree, just focusing on dairy science. Uh, I got there and once I arrived, I suddenly was exposed to things that I had never been exposed to up to that point in time. I fell in love with statistics and economics uh, and then moved away from a three-year terminal degree and ended up getting a four-year degree. Uh, and along the way, I had a four-point average. I ended up being president of most every organization I was involved in, the honor fraternities, uh, Alpha Gamma Rho, which was my fraternity. Um, I learned about uh, how to structure complicated financial deals by raising money for building a new house a new fraternity house near the campus. And that was directly sourced with my experience in 4-H and FFA growing up on a farm. Um, so I, I finished um, in four years. Um, I also had uh, faculty members telling me that I should go on to graduate school or I should go to law school. Up to that point in time, it hadn't crossed my mind. I was still thinking about going back to the dairy farm and then taking over the management of that, that particular farm. Mm -hmm. yeah. But ultimately, I, I applied for law schools and was accepted uh, in a number of law schools and also for a PhD program. And I think I mentioned to you some time ago 
that I was already married with one child with another on the way. When I arrived in the graduate program at University of California, Davis, uh, we had a second child, and then the, there was a third on the way as well. Uh, and uh, that uh, experience, and by the way, one of the reasons I went to Davis is because it was so close to the farm. And I still had responsibilities on the farm, even though I was a graduate student. Mm -hmm. But, but with a fellowship and a research assistantship, I could make more money by going for my PhD than I could by getting ex external employment mm -hmm. with some private company. Mm -hmm. What did you learn in Davis? What was the key? What really? How did it uh, propel you to move forward? Well, I learned most, I, I learned the basics. So I continued to pursue mathematical economic, pardon me, mathematical statistics and uh, economics. And what I learned most was about myself, uh, that I had the basic intellects and the ability to work hard to distinguish myself relative to my fellow graduate students and ultimately the entire faculty. Uh, when I finished two years of coursework, there was a position in econometrics in the department and I applied for the position. And I was selected as a faculty member even though I'd only completed two years of my coursework and moreover was just starting my PhD dissertation. And what I really learned along the way that my reach was well beyond my expectations. While I was on the faculty as, quote, an acting assistant professor, because you can't uh, have a regular position unless you've completed your PhD, which I hadn't. Um, th the six best PhD students wanted me to be the director of their dissertation. So that gave me a clear signal uh, that I had huge upside, and the question was, can I manage it effectively? So that's what I learned most uh, at UC Davis. It was a perfect transition from my background, you know, going to Cal State um, at Fresno and then going to UC Davis. It was the right stepping stone. Mm -hmm. So then you left Davis. Why yes. did you leave Davis and what yes. happened next? Yeah, th th that's not an easy question to answer. Yeah. I, I left in large part because I, coming back to the reach, and I was still trying to assimilate the reach that I had professionally, uh, I was asked to give talks all over the country. The NBR, the National Bureau of Economic Research, uh, began to hold conferences trying to integrate electrical engineering with uh, economic policy making. And I got on the forefront of that and uh, ended up impressing some some significant intellectual capital, some of which were at Harvard, some of which were at University of Chicago. And I also was getting papers, even though I hadn't finished my dissertation, I was getting papers accepted at the Journal of Finance, the American Economic Review, the Journal of the American Statistical Association. So I felt, uh, in, 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 cer certainly I felt as though there was no limits to what I could possibly accomplish so as a result, I applied for a postdoc fellowship at University of Chicago. In the meantime, I had finished my dissertation and the other six fellows that I was actually working with as their director, they all finished shortly thereafter. One of my great fears was that one or more of them was gonna finish before me <laughs> <laughs> because I was publishing these other papers. But more importantly, in 1967, my father uh, unexpectedly died in an automobile accident, and I had to go home. I went home for, well, I went home for six months uh, because my mother and sister couldn't run the dairy farm, and I actually ran it for six months, and then when I was at UC Davis, I was going there every weekend uh, doing the relief milking. Uh, so it was a very hectic period. At that point, my wife and I had three children already, uh, the third child was born three months after my father died. Um, so that very chaotic, chaotic sort of chaotic uh, life at that point in time came to an end when my mother decided to lease out the dairy farm to another operator and move into the nearest town, um, near where her sister, her older sister, lived. 
And when that happened, then I was released. I mean, I could look around and, and decide where to go. So coming back to your question, why did I leave Davis? I left Davis because I think fundamentally I outgrew it. Um, and University of Chicago was available and um, it was a wonderful experience uh, because in contrast to my experience at UC Davis, whenever there was coffee breaks or lunch, people came in and talked sports, played cards, whatever. At University of Chicago, you came in and you talked about current events and what was going on in public policy and, and what, what was working and what wasn't working. It was a much deeper experience with regard to the application of economics and statistics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who, who at the time were the people that you met and admired and... Uh, Ted Schultz at University of Chicago uh, had me, I did a, uh, I was commissioned to do a book early in my career with George Judge, one of our mm -hmm. colleagues. Um, and it was actually a review of quantitative economic analysis by the AAEA, which is now named the Agriculture and Applied Economic Association. Um, and I was commissioned to do that book along with George Judge and uh, Richard Day was another, along with Stan Johnson. And I had done this piece about simulation and there was a lot of work going on building these large scale computer simulation models for various developing countries most of which was orchestrated out of U Michigan State University. So it turned out that um, Ted Schultz asked me to do a review of that work and come and give a presentation uh, in the workshop at University of Chicago. And I got to know him at that point and D. Gail Johnson, uh, also uh, Zeev Grilligus, who then was at Harvard, um, uh, Jerry Hausman, uh, Gregory Chow, if you remember the econometrician, um, he, he also was a real sponsor of me and my work at the time. Mm -hmm. Now, you wrote a book uh, with Ethan Ochman on, uh, on optimal control that I think won a contribution of enduring quality. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, yeah, well, well, that was very interesting. And that's another reason for wanting to leave Davis. Um, Eitan Hockman is a first-rate, wonderful economist, uh, and he was on leave uh, from Tel Aviv University uh, in Giannini Hall in our current department at Berkeley. And he called me up one day and said he wanted to come and visit with me. And he had read some of my work and he said, gee whiz, he'd like to work together. And he was looking at a, a number of, he had already completed a number of applications uh, to firm growth uh, using very advanced analytical models. And he had seen my work and he, th he suggested that maybe we might want to work together. And once again, I thought, gee whiz, if, if my reach now goes to Berkeley um, then and to people from Israel and some first-rate economists, then um, there's no limit to what I might be able to accomplish. So we, we started off on that work um, and I think it took us seven years or so to finish it, um, but it was a real pleasure working with Eitan. Mm -hmm. So from Chicago you moved uh, to Iowa and then to Harvard. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience? Yes. Once, once I finished the postdoctoral fellowship at University of Chicago, um, I think I had about t eight or nine offers from various land grant universities uh, f at a full professorship. And I was, I think I was approximately uh, 30, 31 at the time. And Iowa State had the best applied economics, uh, pardon me, applied statistics department in the country, which is surprising, but not, not that's not fair to awesome. Iowa State. But they had some extraordinary statisticians, mm -hmm. um, and I certainly wanted to go, and they were, they were very uh, supportive of a joint appointment between economics and statistics. So um, I got the full professorship. I already had a full professorship at that point at UC Davis, too, mm -hmm. but I had taken uh, a leave of absence when I was at University of Chicago, and then I resigned that position and accepted the position at Iowa State. 
I was only there for about six months and Harvard came calling uh, with regard to a position. And um, ultimately it was a very attractive position and, and I accepted it and only stayed there for one year. And I there was, being I would uh, say, uh, yes. So, so you went to uh, Harvard. What is the difference between uh, economics, uh, statistics versus a business school in terms of teaching yes, and, and that's environment? A, yeah, that's a very good question. Harvard was a wonderful stepping stone for me, not only in terms of reputation and s signals about the quality of my work up to that point in time, but more importantly, within the business school, there was one particular sequence that was statistical decision theory. They called it managerial economics, but it was really the integration of decision making with statistics. So it was perfect for me, uh, given my interest up to that point in time. And the intensity in terms of the instruction was something I'd never experienced for, before, or for that matter, since. Uh, there were seven different sections of this statistical decision theory course for first year MBA students. And there are a lot of economists, PhD economists that were in the class as well. But at the beginning of each week, we would get together. And at that point in time, the giants in terms of statistical decision theory were all in the Harvard Business School. John Pratt, um, uh, Schleifer, uh, Howard Rafa, Luce was there as well. And we, at the beginning of each week, we met about the pedagogy and the cases that we're going to be teaching over th three different lectures. Uh, and at, at the end of the week, we got together and evaluated what worked and what didn't work. And then we actually recorded all of this for the next group that was going to come on to teach the course. And what was different about that was it's not a straightforward lecture. You have to end up with, you've got boards behind you, you've got, you know, 80 people sitting in rows up where you can see everybody and there's a big name tag right before them. And you're going through the process of trying to elicit from them the right answer. And if somebody makes a huge mistake, surprise, surprise, you're not going to write anything on the board. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody really provides a critical insight, with regard to the inferences that you want to draw, you're writing on the board. So it's, not, it's a short matter before all the students realize the direction in which you want to take the class. And that was a wonderful experience. And, and, and um, I trace it back to my experience as a judge of dairy cattle. When I was an undergraduate, um, I learned a lot about being uh, exposed to uncontrollable events and how then to respond to it. In these dairy cattle judging contests, you would see f there are five different breeds of dairy cattle and you'd have to place them and you'd write down your placing and submit it and then you'd have to go to three judges sitting behind a desk and give your reasons within 10 minutes of actually uh, recording your placement and give your reasons for why you place them the way you did. And I also found out at that time that there's a lot of uncontrollable events. The question is, how do you manage it? How do you respond to it? And moreover, there was one instance, there were three major conferences that were held on dairy cattle judging. And I won two of them. And there's, you know, there's probably 150 college students mm -hmm. uh, participating in this. And then there was one, uh, in Waterloo, Iowa, mm -hmm. which is the National Dairy Congress, um, I actually placed uh, a class of brown Swiss cows backwards from what the way the judge had placed it. But when I gave, went in to give my reasons, they gave me a full score on the reasons <laughs> for doing so. <laughs> but in any event, that, that experience also put me in a good position with regard to the classes that I was teaching at Harvard. I also taught in the economics department, but the most challenging and the most interesting was in fact the case method within the Harvard Business School. Mm -hmm. And also that, you know, after the third year that I taught it, uh, that's when I won an outstanding teacher award because it was the first time in statistical decision theory offered at the Harvard Business School 
where every student in the class gave me the highest grade. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it really, and, and, and by the way, most of them were adverse <laughs> to that methodology, you know, regression analysis, uh, trying to draw inferences, testable hypotheses. They had some of, a lot of these students, they come from a huge different background, some of which had completed law degrees and were coming back changing their professional career. Mm -hmm. Good. So now, when uh, when did you start uh, trading and getting involved in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in business? Was it in Harvard or? Yes, the the maiden voyage into business was at Harvard, and that happened in large part uh, because I got down to a point. My wife and I got a divorce, and with alimony and child support and living costs, I suddenly didn't have any discretionary income. So I looked around and thought about, gee whiz, I have to get another source of income given my financial responsibilities. And I thought about actually turning away from academics very briefly, but I couldn't do it because I simply loved it. So I then spent some time looking around. I'd published a lot of papers and, you know, academic papers on future markets. And some of my fellow faculty members at Harvard and a number of the MBA students encouraged me to set up a uh, hedge fund trading future markets. Uh, we're talking about mm -hmm. different commodities, uh, whether it be the basic grains or even the precious metals or the base metals, and they're very active future markets. So I, I set that up um, and went through the process, and that was the fir first step. Uh, in the direction of some real entrepreneurial activity. Having said that, however, when I was a child growing up, I had already started an enterprise in buying and selling dairy cattle and started a pure breed uh, herd based on my father paid me uh, a salary for the work that I did and I saved that money and started buying cattle. And I used that as my project through 4-H and Future Farmers of America. Mm -hmm. So then suddenly you left uh, Harvard. Yes. Why Berkeley? <laughs> Why Berkeley? Um, I was hoping you were going to ask me this question. Um, when I was uh, a graduate student at UC Davis, I came to a seminar at Berkeley, and I knew nothing about Berkeley. I, I mean, I grew up in a in a very uh, educatedly uninformed household. Um, it was all about work and it was all about managing the farm. Um, so when I was at Davis, uh, there was a seminar that I wanted to come to and it was by Lawrence Klein, who was a Nobel Prize winner and also uh, did much of his uh, dissertation work in, in Jeannie Hall. Mm -hmm. um, so he, I came to the seminar and afterwards, I remember walking by a Sather Gate, walking up Strawberry Canyon, and I was just awestruck. <laughs> I was awestruck, went to Juni, remember when we had the major library mm -hmm. before we went to the digital world? Mm -hmm. And spent a lot of time going through a lot of the dissertations from the 1950s and 1960s. and. I, I simply fell in love with the place. Um, and that's continued through the balance of my life. In fact, I have a quote. Um, I've had the opportunity to reflect on this at my fest shrift and mm -hmm. when there was a tribute dinner for me after I finished as dean. And I said, and I want to quote this, uh, have the citizens of this extraordinary state of California created any institution that's had a greater impact on our past or which has the greater power to shape our future. After over 150 years, Cal Berkeley continues in subtle and often overlooked ways to pour fresh knowledge, human capital, and innovation into the engines of our society. As an institution, Cal Berkeley demands excellence and has little patience for mediocrity. It, it all, often focuses on the latest and the newest, but never allows itself to be consumed by the intellectual fad of the day. It's a body that both thinks before and beyond its time. Mm -hmm. And with regard to the College of Natural Resources, or CNR, which has become our CNR, uh, 
that uh, we've always taken pride in the fact that we were one of the two cornerstones mm -hmm. of the Berkeley campus. Mm -hmm. So, so, so you were in Harvard. You start thinking about moving. Yes, yes. Uh, and the 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 reason for that, uh, first and foremost, was family. Um, my former wife was living in Mountain View, and the three children were with me. I had custody during the summer and during all uh, breaks, uh, holiday breaks, uh, from their respective schools. And I would drive out to California, pick them up in a car, and we'd drive back across the country. And whenever I did a sabbatic, like in Israel, for example, they were always with me uh, because it was, during, it was during the summer, and then they would stay there and go to school uh, with me, there, uh, which, in fact, my former wife granted me the privilege of keeping there to, to, for the, the, the real experience of living elsewhere in the world. But... Um, it was getting very, very difficult to keep up uh, with regard to their uh, maturity process and what was going on. So I wanted to come back to California, and I still had a lot of family here and friends. So I ended up getting an offer from Berkeley and an offer from Stanford. And when I stopped and thought about uh, which of those two places I wanted to be, uh, Berkeley was much more attuned to my value system. And in particular, uh, Berkeley at the time, and I think it's still true, although I haven't looked at the recent data, that Berkeley uh, was probably as an institution more responsible for social mobility uh, for first generation college students uh, than probably any other institution, certainly in the state of California and certainly in comparison to Stanford. Uh, and it was certainly true with regard to a comparison with Harvard uh, as well. When I was there at Harvard, there was a lot of legacy students, undergraduates, um, and that's something you don't, that I didn't <coughs> experience at Berkeley or for that matter at Davis. So I ended up accepting the position at Berkeley. Um, so and you, one of the best choices I ever made. So you, you hired uh, as a chair and uh, you took a department that uh, I was a student that was uh, basically doing uh, quite badly mm -hmm. and within a short period of time you turned it around. What yeah. was the well, I think, secret? Yeah, I, we turned it around. We, the entire faculty <coughs> turned it around. And, and when I arrived, there was these reputation studies and Berkeley Department was ranked 11th in the country. Um, but um, we, we had the right values. We had the right culture. And now the question was, to make tough decisions with regard to avoiding mistakes of giving tenure to people that wouldn't continue to perform at a very high level. Uh, and we set some very high standards and the entire faculty agreed on those standards and we pursued accordingly. And we also upgraded our um, PhD program dramatically um, by doing more active recruitment, um, and we improved the quality of the undergraduate program, but at that point, um, the College of Natural Resources was trying to focus on what it, what it was going to be, and there was a great deal of uncertainty about the college itself. Um, and as a result, we decided, we collectively, the department, um, and I felt very strongly about this, the, the old Tinbergen rule about um, if you're going to have a particular policy you ought, that's going to work, you want to have one target. Or if you've got three or four targets, then you're going to have to th have three or four policies. There's mm -hmm. got to be a match mm -hmm. between uh, the instruments mm -hmm. and the objectives that you're attempting to achieve. So I wanted to put all the focus on the PhD program mm -hmm. because I knew that would be the reputation effects and it would feed on itself because the complementarity between a first-rate graduate program and a first-rate faculty is critical. And if you, if you don't have one, you're, you're unlikely to have the other, um, at least in a contemporaneous mm -hmm. sense. So we uh, upgraded the, the PhD program dramatically, and then at the end of my two terms as chair, uh, the reputation studies and ultimately the national rankings came out, and we were clearly number one. 
mm -hmm. in the country. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the, at the department, in terms of content, did you really see that there was change? It was a traditional agricultural economic department, and during your time, it seems that uh, it become... Yes. Uh, the, the, the notion of agricultural economic has, uh, has changed. Yes, it certainly has. It certainly has. It's expanded dramatically. Um, you know, we, we call ourselves the Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics. At the end of the day, we're a Department of Resource Economics. We do natural resource economics, we do environmental economics, we do economic development, um, and we do, of course, agricultural economics. But, but the fundamental uh, bridge across all of those subfields of economics is, in fact, resource economics. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of work, uh, as you well know, because you've been a leader in a lot of the work in natural resources. And this is, this is a key area of our department. And we provided leadership uh, for the entire country of land-grant universities that have this kind of focus toward uh, environmental economics as well. We, in short order, uh, in the early 1980s through the mid-80s, upgraded dramatically our environmental economics course offerings and our PhD program with regard to environmental economics. And and there was some, along the way, there was some concern on the part of the General Economics Department, gee whiz, they're taking this away from us. Uh, we weren't taking it away from them, we were just making it better. Um, and we, of course, uh, became the real strength of environmental economics on the Berkeley campus, and that continues to this day. Mm -hmm. Good. So, so you were there for several years, and then suddenly there was a shift. Yeah, there was a shift, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I got the opportunity um, to spend some time in Washington, D.C., and I was starting to do much more work uh, at that point in time academically on political economy, uh, on public policy. Uh, and while I was at Harvard, I met um, uh, Clayton Yider, mm -hmm. who came in. He actually was a negotiator in the cheese wars that took place uh, in the 1970s. And he had had me come in and advise him when he became Secretary of Agriculture during the first uh, Reagan administration. Um, actually, he was, no, he was head of USDR. And then subsequently, he was Secretary of Agriculture. But in any event, he, he called me in and asked me to please accept a position on the Council of Economic Advisors in the office of the president. Uh, so as soon as I finished the second term as chair of our department, I did uh, go to Resources for the Future, which is also in Washington, D.C., and I spent uh, a year there uh, as a, as a, with a senior fellowship. And then I spent time working with Yider uh, along the way, and then I accepted a position to go on the Council of Economic Advisors as a senior economist. Mm -hmm. So what... What was the real impact of your work? The real impact of the work at that point in time, this is 1986, 87. I was there for two years. And the chapter in the office of the president, that chapter focused on the disarray that existed within global food and agriculture. And uh, one of the impacts is that that was the last chapter published on that particular topic for the next 20 years, 20 or so years. No one else had ever revisited it after the work uh, that I had done, w along with, with a number of assistants, uh, Doug Irwin, who's a famous economist now, uh, who was at University of Chicago and now is at Dartmouth, uh, was working very closely with me as an assistant, and then we published some papers subsequently related to that work. But fundamentally, it was totally disarray. Why? Because, to give you a concrete example, um, it turns out, coming back to my childhood, the European Union was taking manufacturing buddy, butter, I'm sorry, butter from dairy milk and refeeding it back to the animals uh, to show you how they were trying to deal with the surpluses. If they couldn't dump enough of it on developing countries, then they would have to find a way to avoid the carrying cost of butter that wouldn't be consumed locally by, by the French people in particular. Uh, and here in the United States, 
uh, we had export enhancement programs. The Department of Commerce, which is, quote, anti-economic, uh, that's a personal opinion. Uh, d the Department of Commerce uh, got legislation for export enhancement, which meant you could subsidize the actual export. Uh, and in, it turns out that when you engage the large trading companies to perform the functionality of moving product that's domestically produced here in the United States to these developing countries, you had to pay the high price supports in the US, but you could, whatever price you happen to get in the developing countries, which in some cases were actually zero, mm -hmm. all you had to do is report that back to the Department of Commerce and they would give you the difference between those two. And so their business, uh, I'm talking about the Cargills of the world, their business is actually trading large volumes. This is nirvana for them, uh, free money uh, from the US government. That was going on simultaneously and prices were being driven down throughout the globe um, with regard to agriculture and food items. And as you can imagine, Australia, New Zealand, Thailand in particular, which are major exporters, were very upset about this pro process. So uh, even though the Reagan administration had tried to reform through legislation, as you know, every four years there is a farm bill or uh, a food bill. There's different names that are given, food security, um, whatever's fashionable at the time with regard to the appropriate narrative. But in any event, um, they, the Reagan administration, tried on two separate occasions to reform these policies that were leading to these huge surpluses, once in 1981 and again in 1985. And in both cases, it was dead on arrival. Why was it dead on arrival? Because in our constitution, every state has two senators. And that gives unnecessary weight to the Midwest with regard to continuing to get support through the government to subsidize their actual agricultural activities. And I'm talking not only about the um, Illinois, Iowa, but Minnesota as well, Michigan, all of these states. So how did the work change it? Well, it changed it the following way. Um, again, go, working with the ITER, um, I argued that I started doing work on governance structures and how governance structures influence policy selection. And I argued with Clayton, the only way of getting major reforms was to actually go to a international forum and invite other people to have access to the decision-making process, particularly Australia, New Zealand, uh, Thailand, um, the OECD. So, so basically what you say is that your work really led for ag policy to be part of the GATT. Yes, so yes. You know, this, it uh, became part of the GATT and then that segued, as you know, in the Uruguay round. Uh, that actually was initiated while I was on the council in 1986. And it took uh, till 1995 before there was an ultimate agreement. But what that ultimate agreement did, it eliminated what's called coupled subsidies, namely subsidies or transfer payments that end up in cre creating incentives for more output to decoupled subsidies. Um, and that was a major restructuring. And that would never have happened but for convincing the Congress uh, and the executive office to actually move and allow agriculture to be included in the agricultural negotiations. Because up to that point in time, agriculture was always excluded. So mm -hmm. Why was it always excluded? Because the senators uh, from those Midwestern states didn't want to take the risk of losing control over setting policy. Mm -hmm. Well, this is really and, interesting. So so to some extent, economic analysis that you and others uh, introduced made agriculture part of international trade negotiation and resulted in a much more reasonable policy. Yeah, first time. For first, first time. time. Yeah. Now, when you were in Washington, how did you move from ag policy to suddenly to <laughs> AAD? Yeah, well, um, in, in the negotiations in the 
Uruguay round of the GATT negotiations, which ultimately seek, uh, segued into the World Trade Organization, um, I was asked to go with the three representatives from the USTR, USTR, uh, United States Trade Representative mm -hmm. Office, and they're responsible for trade uh, among countries, uh, representing the United States, of course. Well, they were there negotiating on the Uruguay round, and Yider was there, uh, a fellow by the name of Alan Woods uh, was there as well, and I was the person, along with other staff, sitting supporting them and uh, in, in the negotiation. So I learned a lot about the negotiations, but also it turned out that Clayton Yider was going to be appointed as the new Secretary of Agriculture, and Alan Woods was going to be appointed as the Administrator of AID in the State Department. Um, and AID is the uh, Agency for International Development, Global. right. And its, its principal function is supporting uh, developing countries, either through humanitarian aid or in helping with regard to economic policy making. Uh, so, as a result of that experience, they had me come in and give a couple of seminars. I, you know, I wasn't regarded as a development economist, mm -hmm. uh, but um, I, I had done a war lot of work in policy, governance structures, political economy, and that's what they were looking for at the time. Um, and I was invited to be the chief economist. It was a two-year appointment. I took a leave of absence from Berkeley um, and spent another two years in Washington, D.C. And that, too, was an extraordinary experience because while I was there, the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, and as a result, uh, there was this huge effort that the U.S. government and other Western democracies were engaged in in trying to facilitate market-based economies uh, and capitalism, democracy, in each of the former uh, Eastern European communist countries, as well as member countries of the former Soviet bloc. And I got in on the ground floor of that and also then set up the Institute for Policy Reform, uh, in which, taking the experience of the Uruguay around, I was hoping to apply that on a much broader scale to each of those countries that were in transition. And then there was a huge amount of effort on transition economies. Transition economies, what does that mean? It means you've got communist regimes, you change the st structure of the political process, and you move to some sort of democracy. And along the way, you want to avoid, to the extent you can, crony capitalism. You want to have good governance structures in place and that's what our focus was at the Institute for Policy Reform. So then I became president of the Institute for Policy Reform, even though I'd come back to Berkeley after the two years and ran that for another two years. And during that period, I was also asked by my department to become chairman again, mm -hmm. which I did. Right. And then uh, suddenly you became dean. Yes. Why did you, why did you, why did you close this? Job and now, yeah, that's a very good question, David. It turns out I had no intention of, of becoming dean. I I had done what I regard as more than I my share of the joint burden of running academic departments, and I'd served three times as ch chair of ARE, Agriculture and Resource Economics. And moreover, I was president of the Institute for Policy Reform, so that was sort of my outside activity. Um, and then I was also involved at the same time in some entrepreneurial activities, including co-founding a firm with three colleagues, one from the business school, one from the law school, and one from the economics department. And I was doing all those things at the same time, but I wanted to get back into my research. But it turns out that the Office of the President in 1992-93, uh, there were major budget cuts. We were in a recession um, in, the, in the United States. And as a new, as a potential dean, the first thing the potential dean was going to have to do was downsize the staff by 50%. But more importantly, uh, the vice president, uh, 
responsible for natural resources and agriculture in the office of the president in Oakland wanted to downsize College of Natural Resources by about 40%. Mm -hmm. uh, and the question is who was going to step in uh, to, be, to provide real leadership uh, in trying to determine what the right answer was with regard to that so-called realignment. And I just sat back and I, I, quite frankly, this may sound a bit arrogant, but I looked around and there were four other people that had applied for the deanship and I decided that they weren't gonna be able to get it done, but I knew I could. So I applied for the position and then I got the deanship and that's 19, early 1994. Mm -hmm. So, how did the, you kept the, what is now uh, RCNR intact? Um, I think, you know, the best example uh, of that, learning early from my experience of working with my colleagues in ARE and the trust and respect that we had for one another and, and setting specific goals and pursuing them, uh, in a disciplined and managed way that I learned a lot from that experience and, and it's all about trust and, and respect at the end of the day. And when I applied for the deanship, the person who was chancellor at the time was Chancellor Tian and the provost is Carol Christ, which is our current uh, chancellor at UC Berkeley. And along the way, I also not only maintain trust and respect with regard to my colleagues within my department, I really went out of my way to service not only our interest, whatever our happens to be with regard to the academic unit, and the person that we were reporting to. Doris Calloway was provost. I had a wonderful working relationship with her. When I first became chair in my, my department, uh, uh, Heyman was the chancellor, Rod Park was the vice chancellor. I had good working relationships with them. Uh, and whenever, you know, something as silly as Gordon Getty writing a piece on the theory of interest rates, who did they, who did Heyman and, and Rod Park send it to? He sent it to me to review <laughs> and then to meet with Gordon Getty to tell him that it was mostly nonsense. They didn't take it to the macroeconomic people in the economics department. So that's the kind of relationship that I try to develop over the years and it worked very well. But the one that worked especially well was with Carol Chris because she came into the provost office the same time I became dean of the College of Natural Resource, Resources. And she had to work with me hand in hand in dealing with this realignment proposal. And um, you know, over the years, I, I think I, my last count, I counted up something like 36 uh, awards and honors, you know, best journal article, research discovery, uh, publication of enduring quality policy awards, even awards, leadership awards from the mm -hmm. State Department. Or another example is the awards for, for, from the American Antitrust Institute. But the, ma the major excitement and gratification for me is the kind of comments of people that I've worked with you know, on a daily basis. Carol Chris, in particular, um, at my Festschrift, she made a, a series of comments. And then at my tribute dinner, by the way, she plagiarized her own work because she actually published it, the tribute dinner. But I'd like to share this. Um, uh, and she says, and I quote, uh, the philosopher Berlin made a distinction based on the fragment from the Greek poet on the fox and the hedgehog. The fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. For Ber Berlin, the, the distinction marks the deepest difference between different kinds of writers and thinkers. Fox, foxes pursue many ends, often unrelated. Hedgehogs relate to everything to a single central vision. Shakespeare is a fox. Milton is a hedgehog. Or, to switch to spheres of activity, Bill Clinton is a fox. Kenneth Starr is a hedgehog. I've been wondering whether Gordon is a fox or a hedgehog. 
He brought an extraordinary variety of innovative ideas and strategies to his deanship. The personality of the, of the fox. He knows many tricks, but his most characteristic strategy is to resort to first principles. In that, he is a hedgehog. He has insisted on uncompromising standards of excellence. At the same time, he created an organization for the college that respects its variety and heterogeneity. It's a testimony to his achievement as dean that he is something of both the fox and the hedgehog, or to return to my first metaphor, the boxer who can weave and dodge, can stand his ground, can jab effectively and deliver a knockout blow when he sees his opening. I mean, that's, there's nothing quite more uh, infectious about making a difference than someone like Carol Chris taking the time and effort to record such comments. It's much more important than any and all the awards and honors that I've gotten over the years. But what, what really happened? What, what really happened was that along the way, um, we did a number of restructurings. We moved to um, countering the realignment proposal, making strong arguments that the shared governance structure principles had been violated by the office of the president. I went and made presentation to the system-wide academic council and explained this. And there were some people that were very upset about that. But because we had the inside lane and the right track, we prevailed. We ended up, instead of decreasing the size of the enterprise of CNR, or the College of Natural Resources, by 40% that was recommended by the Office of the President, we ended up uh, midway through my deanship by increasing it by 80, 40, by 50%, because we went from 80 faculty at that point to 120. So, um, and, and with, with that growth, there was great excitement about recruiting new people, uh, finding the best possible people we could uh, for each and every open position, and there was a real excitement within the college. And then also the other major opportunity that took place, we set up a number of what I would call green shoots in terms of centers of excellence. You were responsible for more than one in that respect, but we set up other centers. Uh, we actually took the savings we had, put it into a pot and then redistributed it in accordance with excellence of what discretionary funds we had as a college, including the endowment. Um, that created a lot more excitement. And then uh, I sat on the Biotechnology Council that was set up as an advisory body for Chancellor Tian with regard to biotechnology. And I observed what uh, the biologists from MCB were attempting to accomplish, and I came to the conclusion that they had it asked backwards, quite frankly. And um, the... So now, now we come to the Novartis. Yeah, yeah, that's where I'm going. <laughs> exactly. so, yeah. so maybe so, tell us about the Novartis. Yeah, 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 certainly. Okay. So it turns out plant microbial biology was having great difficulty attracting the very best graduate students. And as I noted before, I've always been um, a subscriber to the principle is you can't have a first-rate faculty without a first-rate graduate program. So um, they were having some difficulties and some of their major professors were also getting offers from various places and we were having difficulties um, retaining them. Um, and the graduate population, at least the quality of it, was dissipating rather dramatically because a number of other major universities, Stanford, Harvard, Princeton, all the big universities, were moving into this field of biotechnology, plant biotechnology in particular, uh, which is the domain of the Department of Plant and Microbial Biology. So um, I spent a fair amount of time with the, a few key people from the department, including the chair, and they were, they were trying to raise money to support their graduate program, but they were getting nowhere. Uh, there was no real interest in any donors to step forward and help them in this regard. So I said, why don't we just pursue a very active strategy? We'll send out a proposal to each and every one of the 
major plant biotech biotechnology companies in the world and invite them uh, to enter in negotiations with us about joint public private partnerships with regard to research and development um, and and as a result we sent that out to 15 different companies uh, five have responded very positively uh, three of the faculty and I went out to four of them. One of them was a Japanese company and it didn't really seem as though it was a real opportunity. But the other four all in the United States were. We went out and made presentations to each of them, then went into negotiations. Um, and each of them came forward with specific offers. And we had requirements as well. Um, and the one that we ended up selecting was Novartis. Now this resulted as a huge amount of controversy because a number of faculty uh, were convinced that if in fact we did a, a private uh, public partnership like this, the corporation would end up controlling the research agenda of the faculty. And that happened at a number of other places. Washington U is a perfect example in terms of their relationship with Monsanto, which has its headquarters also in St. Louis. And they had to they Monsanto had total control over the research agenda because they put out RFPs. Mm -hmm. um, so we were aware of this, and, and at the end of the day, it was a bit more complicated than this, but it turned on academic freedom and whether in fact you could enter into such an agreement, but the faculty still had individual freedoms with regard to what they wanted to work on and what they did work on. Um, it would result in a lot of money that would come to supporting graduate students and moreover the overhead turned out to be generating something like we generated maybe twelve and a half million dollars for the oh, oh. rest of the campus oh. uh, by this this particular uh, program and and uh, moreover um, our current chancellor referred to that as the opening the door to real entrepreneurship in terms of these public-private partnerships. We had a number of subsequent ones that have taken place following the pattern that was established by the Berkeley Novartis Agreement. And the, the controversy once again came back to people's fears, justifiably, if in fact you eliminated academic freedom. But the whole point, in fact, I published a book on just this question about how we went about structuring to maintain the academic freedom mm. uh, while, while increasing the resource base to improve the graduate program and the quality of the faculty research, which we certainly did, and, and that's been documented in a number of other places. And there's, there was some bad press during this period of time, too, the Atlantic Monthly did a piece on the kept university mm -hmm. um, and gave examples of how the dean of Haas was the Bank of America chair professor and that's an instance that Bank of America had some influence over mm -hmm. Haas Business School and used um, me as an example about we got money from Novartis and thus we were beholden to Novartis, that's just nonsense. Well, I, I think 10 years or 20 years down <laughs> the line, I think we really see that yeah. this is over. Now, after your deanship, you continue to be a professor, but then suddenly you surprise everybody with uh, the big gift. What was the motivation and what is the vision and where do you see it going? Well, in my experience, well, first of all, let me back up, that I had a fair amount of luck, I started founded, co-founded a, a couple of companies along the way, and I briefly described to you the, my hedge fund. And I pursued uh, various entrepreneurial activities. I was an expert witness in a lot of major cases that related to one of my companies. And I was always looking for the complementarities between the work that I was doing in the real world, quote, whatever that is, uh, and the academic world. And I found those complementarities and as a result uh, had the good fortune of, of generating a fair amount of wealth. Uh, so when I got to the point of retirement and had the fest shrift, I was sort of caught up in, in how the university turned out for my fest shrift. Like Randy Katz, who is vice chancellor of research, said he thought it was one of the best fest shrifts he'd ever been to, not only here but elsewhere. 
and he he was the MC for the two days of the Festschrift here at UC Berkeley. But after I came away from it, I thought, gee whiz, given my experience as dean and when I was chair, we were always sort of chasing for resources, trying to do things that we could have had a much larger impact if we had access to those resources. And so I decided to um, gift to the University of California, Berkeley, um, a $50 million gift, um, which I spent um, a couple of months right after the Feshrif. I think it was probably a month and a half afterwards, right in the midst of, of the COVID-19. And we got that negotiated and got it instituted at the end of 2020. So how did your family react? React? They lose, your, they lose their inheritance. No, they didn't lose their inheritance. There's, no, no, no. They're, they were all protected. I, I, in terms of my nine grandchildren, I set up a, a trust for them uh, long ago, um, and they are all doing very well. And I also did a fair amount of estate planning for my three children and transferred a lot of wealth. They were very, you know, they have nothing to worry about financially. <laughs> So now, they were. This wasn't taken from them, basically. Now, what about your your ranch and the? Yes. Okay. Along the way, um, when I came back to after being in Washington D.C., um, because there was a fair amount of chaos, as I described early in their lives, I decided that I wanted to build a family compound. Um, and that's another reason for why I didn't take all this money from them and give it to the university, because I set up this family ranch, and moreover, um, it's a it's a large family and it's a family compound, and we're there uh, every year. Uh, three of my grand nine grandchildren say it's their favorite place in the whole world, which which is well beyond my expectations. And likewise, uh, my children spend probably 60 to 70 percent of their leisure time at the ranch um, and we are always there for the holidays and, and various birthdays and and other events that have taken place uh, over the years so um, that that's a very important of uh, part of my overall life at this juncture and has been I bought the place in 1999 right after I actually bought it and then once I finished this Dean I spent the next eight years um, improving the infrastructure and the landscaping and all the rest of it. But it's a real treat. Go, go on. Uh, we all know that you are a sport fan. Mm -hmm. But what do you do for fun and how do you? Well, f one thing is the ranch, which is in Grass Valley. It's about a two-hour drive from here. Um, I'm uh, a, an avid horseback rider. Um, I have endurance horses. Um, I also have a a cutting horse, uh, which is a very high uh, spirited horse that ends up cutting cattle out of large herds. Uh, and it'll turn on a dime almost horizontally. Um, so that's one of the activities. But, but the, the real leisure time activity over the course of the last 40 or so years has been family. Um, and also, now that I've got the ranch, that is the gathering place uh, for the family coming together. Uh, but I, we do go skiing. Um, we spend a fair amount along those lines. And then uh, over the years, as you know, I was a Golden Gloves boxer in high school, and I continue to box. In the next room, you'll see a gym with a bag sitting there, and I spend every other day working out 10 rounds on that bag. And on occasion, uh, some of my family members uh, strap on the gloves and we do a fair amount of sparring together. Um, well, good. So now what are you doing these days in retirement? I, I, I'm, I, I'm doing what I believe probably unjustifiably the best research of my life. <laughs> I'm doing work now on the curation of smart governments and uh, this is in part due to you and, and the co-editors on the essays in my honor uh, that has just been published. But there was a chapter that was the way forward, 
and one of one of my PhD students was here as a postdoc, and he ended up co-authoring that with two of the co-editors, you and Jill McCluskey, and we sat around talking about the work that I had done before and what this what does this, this have to do with smart governments, mm -hmm. and we made some real discoveries because <laughs> we we were thinking deeply about. What is the way forward if you look at this cumulative work, the academic work in particular, or entrepreneurial work, what does it imply about how smart governments should be designed? How can they make better policies? And that's what we're writing the book on now. And in contrast to all this debate about inequality and how to deal with inequality, uh, the approaches for dealing with that, we're making the argument that, that the approaches are wrong. The right approach is, yes, you can deal with inequality, but only through increasing mobility and increasing asset diversification. And that's got to be the outcomes of any policies that you might pursue. But that sounds simple, but in terms of doing the mathematics and showing that it is, in fact, um, a internally consistent framework, uh, we've done that. So basically, once a scholar is always a scholar, <laughs> even though he's boxing on the side. <laughs> uh, Gordon, it was really quite uh, interesting and uh, illuminating, and thank you very much for uh, telling uh, us a fascinating story of your life. Thank you. Thank you. You're more than welcome, David.